All right, so we're going to start with the quiz. Everybody have WMS going? All right. Uh, here is the project area that, oh, geez, why does it do that? All right, uh, zoom in on Huntington area. And I'll leave this up for a bit as you get going. The watershed we're interested in, outlets here, Three Mile Creek. So it's on uh, Ohio River Road, which is Route 2. So if you just look, it's uh, right across from, what part of Ohio is this? What's the name of this town? Barron? By Proctorville. So anyways, it's uh, to the east of Huntington, Three Mile Creek. And so to get the entire watershed, you'll want to have a view that's, well, that's probably more than we need. That would do it, I bet. Okay. So let me pause the recording. I'll leave this up as I hand out the paper. Okay, let me demonstrate something about the land use table. If you're having trouble downloading that, what you need to do, I've mentioned this before, but just for a point of uh, review, right click on it and do save link as. And that way, rather than just displaying it, it'll allow you to download it to whatever location you choose. So again, you right click on the link rather than clicking on it with the left mouse button. Once you right click, then you can do save link as. Like during the quiz. <laughs> All right, so um, let me go through the solution here. And as you have questions, feel free to stop. Uh, I'm going to begin by starting the uh, new project. And uh, always browse to a location that you know you're going to be able to find again. And you may want to uh, just create like a temporary folder, you know, so that it's not mixed in amongst a dozen other ones. And then you have to click Save for it to be able to actually do it. All right, so define the project. And remember, we're in Zone 17, Northern Hemisphere, here in West Virginia. and. Uh, the location of interest is Three Mile Creek. So what you need to be able to do, the skill, is to have someone tell you, hey, there's a creek that goes next to a road. Analyze that watershed. You know, I'm not going to give you the latitude and longitude of the outlet. I'm just going to say, here's a creek and here's a road. And what we're interested in is the crossing of the two. So. Um, I may give you a general idea of the watershed in the same way that a client would just say, well, it's along Ohio River Road by such and such, all right? So here's our project location. Sometimes WMS pops that wizard back in the background, and so you have to click to get it back again. Um, all right, so I'm going to get the data, and the three data files that I need is the elevation, the land use, and the soil type. That's what I need to be able to get the curve number is those three things. Well, to get the curve number, you only need the shape file and the land use, but I need the elevation data in order to delineate the watershed to begin with. So it goes and gets the uh, land use and the uh, DEM. Now it's getting the soil type shape files, probably more than we actually need. And then there they are in the background. And so the next step will be to run topaz to do the analysis of cell adjacency. I'm just for now going to switch off these soil type files because I don't need to see them quite yet. And uh, I can either go into the wizard or through the DEM menu have it do the topaz. I'll just do it through the wizard though. Um, it's in the background, I guess. There it is. All right, so next step compute topaz, and you see the threshold of 10 acres. If you ever do topaz, but then you don't see any streams, it could be that you have a really high threshold set for what it actually displays the areas at. Yeah, I had it zoomed in relatively close, and so it terminated the topaz really quickly. And if I close this, then you can see there's the streams, and here's the one I'm interested in. But where to actually place the stream? I'm going to need mapping data in the background to be able to see where the road is. So I'm going to do get online maps, adding that map file, and it's going to show me where is Route 2, and then I'll drop the uh, outlet just upstream of Route 2. So here is the crossing. I'm going to drop the outlet just on the upstream side of that, and now I can delineate the basin. Go in here to delineate watershed, delineate it. 
It crunches the numbers, and I have the answer to the first question. So what you should have for the area is about 233 acres, depending on where you drop that outlet. Uh, if you dropped it in the Ohio River, that's maybe a little imprecise. But if you dropped it in the middle of the road, then I guess that's not the end of the world. All right, so calculate the watershed curve number using the land use table provided. All right, so what we're going to have to do is um, go over here into the calculators. But before I do that, I need to find out which of these soil type files is actually the right one. So I'll turn on this one. I don't see anything. So it must be you know, out of the, uh, the area. But there they are. So I'm, first of all, I'm going to delete that, delete that one that doesn't matter. Delete that. All right, so turn this on. Yeah, so the, here's the soil data in the watershed that I care about. So with it on, I'm going to create, well, it doesn't matter if it's on or not, but I'm going to create a new coverage, a soil coverage. So here is a soil type coverage. And remember, I need to join NRCS data. And then I can select all of the uh, polygons that are meaningful to me. And then mapping shapes to feature objects. So the soil type coverage is going to get data from this shape file that I've got right here. And the key thing is making sure that it maps hydrologic soil group to SCS soil type, and it does. So finish, and now all of that data is up here in the soil type coverage, and I don't need this shape file anymore, so I can delete that. I'm going to save my work just in case slash when the program crashes. Um, so now I can do the calculators. Back to the hydrologic modeling module, calculators, compute GIS attributes. So it's going to use the soil type coverage for soil type. It's going to use this land use grid that we downloaded here for the land use. And now I just need to import the soil, tab soil table. Um, I think I've got that in several locations. Not in the music folder, though. <laughs> All right. Uh, courses. All right. IWW curve number. All right. So now OK, and it'll ask me where to put that, but what we really need is just the, the number here, 70.2. When I did it yesterday, it was 70.3. So you guessed? Yeah. You should have kept that to yourself, really. All right. So any questions so far? Yeah. All right, so there's that's the workflow to get to the curve number. Now, you can still get answer three without the curve number. You don't need a curve number to do NSS. Let me turn off the soil type. Uh, I don't need to see this map anymore, so I can switch that off. For that matter, I don't need to see the uh, elevation data any longer. So all I want to do here is switch the calculator from HEC1 to NSS. And if I double click on the symbol here, uh, I'm not in Alabama. I'm in West Virginia. Got lots of options here. Anybody remember what region we're in? Western Panhandle. Uh, no, not Western Panhandle. No, we're in the Western Plateau, yeah. Um, oh, OK, yeah. So I'm going to remove it. Oh, there it is. Select it. And uh, compute results. I don't need to do anything about the max flood envelope. Um, because you know, I, I could put in the max flood region. But what I'm really interested in here is what is the 10-year return period. And so 144 CFS. Okay, And then the last thing is asking about TR55. If you ever want to sound awkward, like in a hydro talking with hydrologists, say TR55. They'll be like, what? It's TR55, not TR55. All right, so we'll switch to TR55 and uh, open that up. And you'll notice it already has the curve number that I calculated before. But I need to calculate the time of concentration using that curve number. So we'll compute using the lag time SCS method. Here we've got the watershed length, the slope, the curve number that I already did. And it's saying 0.26 hours. So when I click OK, it'll take that 0.26 hours of a lag time 
convert it to a time of concentration by multiplying by 5 thirds, and so that's where the 0 .46, um, 426 hours comes from. I need to switch it from type 1 to type 2 and change the rainfall depth from 1 inch to 3.63, which is the 10-year storm depth for a 24-hour storm. And uh, let's see, there it is, 204, 205 CFS. I had 205 yesterday. I guess maybe I clicked in a slightly different spot. And we can compute the hydrograph if you want, but really it's the peak discharge that I'm interested in. But let's look at that hydrograph. There it is, a hydrograph for 100 years. All right, any questions? Um, yeah, so uh, the soil that, what soil that I get, let's see, I was getting, there we go, yeah, it was there when I downloaded it, you saw me, okay, other questions, it's, it's always obvious in retrospect, but you need to make it obvious in, What's the opposite of retrospect? In forespect? You need to know WMS well enough that you can just knock through setting up an, a HEC1 model for the exam. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of our class time today doing is start with a watershed, do all of what I just did, but then also working forward into HEC1. And specifically, I want you to get, you know, we, how we just briefly played around with the stochastic modeling at the end of class. The, on the Thursday before break, we're going to try and uh, get into the sto stochastic modeling today where you try both a variety of different curve numbers and a variety of different rainfall depths to see uh, the effect of uncertainty. All right, so to do that, uh, create a new watershed project and uh, let's all browse to a new location and so use the wizard to start a new project. I'm going to uh, put this just in a temporary folder. And let's call this um, Heck one demo. You can call it whatever you like though. So um, for the location, north of the Huntington Mall, all right, yeah. So this stream, the Cabell Creek, Little Cabell Creek Road has a stream that goes along it. And I'm not exactly sure how big that watershed is, but I think, uh, I don't want to spend all day chasing that stream, so let's actually go with this one, because I think it terminates. So the Big Bowen Highway, that's the road that connects Route 2 with Target and that shopping center there. Okay, so let's do this. This watershed that go, dumps into the Big Bowen Highway, so I think if our project area is this, it's going to be definitely all that we need. In fact, I'm going to zoom in even more. So let's use this watershed. And of course, it's really about the workflow, not about the specific location. So once you get the location, go through all the process that we just did for the quiz, um, including delineate the watershed, um, calculate the curve number. But then instead of going into NSS or TR55, we'll go into HEC1. So I'm just going to silently work through setting that up to that point rather than narrating my every step. But if you want to watch and follow along, then you can, of course. Yeah.
yeah. The final is cumulative. There will be an emphasis on the material since the midterm, though. If you have an unreliable computer, you might want to borrow a reliable one for the final. If you have any friends with a good computer or something like that. Don't hold back your forgiveness right now. <laughs> something just, I can trim the watershed. Not much necessary. You don't have to trim the watershed. Not necessarily. So I'm just like, okay. Yeah, you don't have to trim the DM. So if you'd guessed 70 on this one, you would have been wrong. This, this watershed 67. So if you just double click, then it will bring up the parameters. And we only have one watershed, so we don't have to worry about flipping between sub-basins and so on. But for precipitation, the easiest thing to do is a basin average. And for the precipitation, put in minus 1. Because we're going to do the stochastic modeling, and that's the flag that it's going to use to know that precipitation should be defined somewhere else. But we do need to click Define Series and set for it to be a Type 2 24-hour storm. OK. And then for the loss method, where it says Curve Number, have it minus 2. 
And that's the flag that tells it to look elsewhere for the curve number. Now for the unit hydrograph method though, we're going to calculate it based on basin data. We'll use the uh, lag time SCS method. And we need to remember the curve number from before to calculate an accurate lag time. It was uh, 67 for this watershed. And so you'll type that in. 0.39 hours is the lag time, so it gets the lag time defined. Now, even though I just put in, manually keyed in the curve number, it's still, oh, okay, I'm glad I checked. I thought it would have kept. I need to put it back to minus two for the curve number. But it did not change our uh, lag time. The lag time is still defined. So, all right, done. Now, under HEC 1, job control is where we tell it how many different uh, simulations to run and at what frequency. So 15 minutes, we'll, we'll leave that. But I'd like for it to do 150 steps in the model rather than 100. So change that. And then here under stochastic modeling is where we're going to say, let's, let's just do uh, 25 simulations and define the stochastic model. We need to add two variables where minus one was, was the precipitation and minus two was curve number. I'm going to double check that because I want to make sure. So precipitation minus one, curve number minus, oh, that's two. Yeah, minus two. All right. So back here to the stochastic modeling. Minus one precipitation, minus two curve number. So now this is where you can have it define what values to use for all 25 runs. And you can see right now it's randomly generated based on a range. Now the precipitation range, let's have it do, like what if our 95% confidence interval was uh, between uh, 2.2, well, let's actually look up using the precipitation data frequency server. So for this project area, what is our 95% confidence interval for the rainfall for the 10-year storm? So we are interested here. Zoom in a bit more. All right, so in this area, the 10-year storm, 10-year return period, 24-hour storm, from 3.4 to 3.86. So that's our uncertainty range, 3.4 to 3.86. So let's have it start at, I'm not sure how this works, 3.4. to 3.86. Now, let's start 3.4. All right, so now everything is within that range from 3.4 to 3.86, randomly selected following a normal distribution. And the curve number, we calculated it was 67, but let's have the minimum range be, it might be as low as 64, and at the maximum it might be as high as 71. And then all of the combinations of curve numbers within that range. So we've got a randomly distributed between curve number and um, precipitation. Okay, so we, any questions so far? Um, for the uh, for the rainfall, the minimum is 3.4, the max is 3.86. Maybe for the starting value, I should do the middle. So the starting value, maybe the smarter thing to do would be 3.63, since that's the middle range, 3.63. So for the starting value, you put in what you think it is, and then minimum and maximum defines the, uh, the confidence interval. Okay. 
So we've got that. Now this is the tricky part, is getting it to run, because depending how many folders deep it is, I think is where it will crash versus run. So if you've got it in a subfolder within a subfolder within a subfolder, then you may have some trouble on this next step. But here you can see I've just got it in temp, heck one demo, heck one demo, and so I think it's going to run. Click OK. Oh, it didn't. All right, let me try that again. So save all this. And in this stochastic modeling, maybe changing this base file name. Maybe I'll put it in a shallower folder. All right, let's try now. Save it. Run. Fingers crossed. Hey, it's working. All right, so it's running all these simulations. And then when it's done, it'll put together a hydrograph that has the, the output, the, the runoff, for each one of those combinations of precipitation and uh, curve number. And so it'll have some that's a high precipitation and a high curve number. And that's going to lead to a really uh, large runoff estimate. Or it may have some of them that's a combination of a low precipitation depth and a low curve number, and then we'll have hardly any runoff for those. So it did all 25 runs, and we'll open up the hydrograph, and you can see there is the envelope of possibilities. You know, some of them as low as, it looks like about 150 CFS, some of them as high as 340 CFS. So that's quite a range, and we could export those by doing that right-click thing that we've been through before. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause the recording and help you troubleshoot running through that if you get the same error message I was getting initially. I think the solution is to change where it saves the base file name. You have to have it save the base file name someplace that is not like a locked system reserved folder. That may have been what the issue was before.